It is an absolute honor to have you with us. Thank you so much for Thank coming. Thank you. Me. And so um, we have lots of people here, and we all respect um, Southwest so incredibly much. And one of the things that's so captivating to me is this theme of this conference is called Unlimiting God. And so you have a very unique story of coming from uh, a legal assistant, legal secretary, to the president of probably the most successful airline in history. Yes. So tell us how you kind of got there. Well, um, I certainly had somebody leading me, and um, I have to believe it was spiritual because I had no um, background, experience, education, or there was no reason that this little girl from the sticks of Vermont, who I was born and raised, should have ended up holding any of the positions that I held, except for the fact that I was raised by the golden rule. I always believed in it. I thought of that as um, a more spiritual thing than a religious thing, if you will. And um, it's, it's interesting. Um, I went to SMU, um, I, I didn't attend SMU, but I went to SMU to do some research one day, and I looked up the Golden Rule, and I found out that there are 36 religions in the world, and every one of them has the equivalent of a Golden Rule. It might not be stated that way, but, but the idea is that if you respect others the way you would like to be respected, and if you treat others the way you would like to be treated, um, it comes back to you in kind. So that's kind of, um, I had no money, I had no <laughs> education, I had no real training, and I had really no mentors when I was a young girl, and um, except my mom, who was a wonderful role model. And I decided that I would be a legal secretary because that was all I could do. I mean, I, I couldn't afford to go to college. I couldn't afford to get a law school. I was kind of fascinated by the law. And so I became the best darn legal secretary in the world, in my mind, and, and I think I actually accomplished that. So I started working for lawyers when I was a junior in high school and continued to do that back in the day when people could get drafted. My husband got drafted, um, so he went into the Air Force for four years. And I ended up in um, San Antonio, Texas, uh, because that was where he spent his last year in the service. I went into every building in San Antonio that was more than six stories high, looked on the marquee for law firms, and just walked in off the street. Now, I like to say I discovered Herb Kelleher, who was the founder of Southwest <laughs> Airlines, versus he discovered me. Um, because he really did need help, and I was going to save his soul, you know. And so um, I literally I went to work for Herb in 1967, and um, the, the rest is sort of history. My passion in life is really customer service, excellent customer service delivery. So I could have done that anywhere. I think I did it quite well as a legal secretary for many years for many people. And I, from there, just sort of, you know, life evolves sometimes. You don't plan it. <laughs> it just happens. Um, for that whole year that we were in San Antonio, I lived for the whole year thinking I'd be back in New England three days later <clears throat> after my um, now ex-husband got out of the service. And um, it just didn't happen. Hmm. So... so Tell us about your leadership philosophy, your leadership point of view in the pyramid. You know, I, be I believed in um, servant leadership even before I ever heard the definition. When I actually heard or when I read uh, Peter Greenleaf's book was pointed out to me and, and I read it and I thought, it was kind of like when I read Atlas Shrugged when I was 17, you know, I read it twice and I thought, oh my gosh, this person thinks the way I think, you know, it's kind of really creepy. And, and when I read uh, Peter Greenleaf's book, I thought, you know, I believe in this, but I've never really particularly talked to anybody about it. To me, servant leadership um, is all about serving first and leading second. And, um, 
And when I say that you need to serve, I don't mean that you need to be subservient. I mean that you need to serve a cause, a purpose, um, a passion, a belief, and it, to, to truly serve any of those things, you have to believe in what you're doing from the depths of your soul, and you have to um, be able to inspire others to join with you. And it has to be something that makes you a better person. And it has to be for something that's bigger than self-aggrandizement or success or, or whatever. It has to be for the better good, if you will. Um, and I think when people do that, and they sort of take their personal out of it and kind of put the personal over here, but they look like those great videos that you know that you saw this morning. I mean, yes, you enjoyed those things personally, but you also enjoyed the, re to me, life is all about relationships. Everything is about relationships, right? And so you, if you can capitalize on the relationships and you can all be working for the really sort of something that is better than yourself and going to make others better off, and, and you don't do those things for accolades. You do them because of the right things to do. But you get an incredible amount of satisfaction, personal satisfaction, when you do them. And it's, it, um, I watched y'all, I, I observe people all the time. That's what I've done all my life. I, I'm an airport groupie. I sit in airports and I study. I sit in hotel lobbies and I study and I watch people. I love to, I mean, I really, I think if there was such a thing, I think I'm a behavioralist expert, you know? And I form all these stories in my head about these people. I'm sure I'm wrong half the time, but, <laughs> but I make up stories when I watch all of that and I see what works and what doesn't work in terms of exchanges between human beings. Um, I think that's one of the reasons that um, Southwest has been successful. And I'm not talking about, um, although we did have some great, brilliant leaders and business minds and all of that, but the success of Southwest Airlines is not really um, due to brilliant leadership. It's due to wonderful people who want to make a positive difference and they do so together and collectively they create something pretty darn special um i mean i could sit here and tell you stories for three days but we don't have three days so anyway to me servant leadership means you serve first you lead second you give 110 percent every day and if you make decisions based on based from your heart and your head and some plain old common sense, 99.9% .9 of the time, regardless of the rules or the procedures or the policies, you're going to be okay and people are going to understand that. Then if you follow that, if, if every one of you, and I suspect a lot of you do, if no matter what business you're in or no matter what cause you're promoting, if you thought about yourself as being the ultimate customer service deliverer, if you will, of whatever it is that you're delivering, it makes your decisions 10 times easier because you don't have to think about all the bureaucratic things that you have to go through. And, you know, it's, it's nice to cross T's and dot I's, but... Honestly, if you go with your heart most of the time, we tell our folks in terms of customer service delivery, as long as it's not illegal, unethical, or immoral, if you think about the decision that you're making, regardless of what the guidelines say or the rules say or the procedures say, go with it and we will back you because it's the right thing to do.
may not necessarily be done in the right way as written on a piece of paper. But if you use some plain old common sense. So give us an example maybe of how that worked really well and maybe one that maybe didn't work so well. Well, you have to, <laughs> I can give you both. <laughs> um, <laughs> the one that works well, actually your son was telling me that it's his favorite Southwest story. Um, that he heard, and I'll, I'll try to tell it quickly. Um, and I tell this story <clears throat> to make two points. Um, one, to confirm that our, and, and at least in my heart, to confirm that our employees understand that they really are empowered to make customer service decisions. And, um, you know, Corporate America uses that word empower all the time, every day, and I don't think half of them, or maybe even more than half, they really, they say they empower their people, but they don't really walk the talk. They really don't empower their people. We really do empower our folks. And, and this story, um, which some of you may have actually even heard because it became it went so viral i mean it just went everywhere and very quickly we had a passenger who was in um, california somewhere uh, at a conference and he got a call in the middle of the morning from his daughter who told him that her son his grandson had been shot in a freak accident and was not going to was not expected to live even for many hours, a young teenage boy. He says, okay, and just obviously she needed him at home. So the grandfather calls our reservation center and um, says, what is the next plane I can get? I think he was in LA. What is the next plane I can catch to wherever it was he was going? I don't remember. And um, so the um, res agent said, well, it, it's in 40 minutes, but I don't know if you can even get to the airport from downtown in 40 minutes. He said, book me on that flight. I am on my way, and I won't have luggage. I won't have anything. I'm going to grab a cab. I'll leave all my stuff here. I'll come back and get it later. And he said, I'm heading for the airport. So she said, Okay, she said, I can't book you because ever since 9-11, you can't book a flight that's less than 60 minutes from departure. That's one of the things they look for is last-minute flights. She said, I can't book you, but get in a cab and head out there, and they will know that you're on your way. He said, great. So he jumps in the cab, and he heads off. So, so that's one employee he has talked to. Now, that employee really didn't have to do anything because there was, you know, there wasn't any reservation made and you don't know if she even knows anybody at the airport. So, but anyway, that one employee. So she calls an employee at the gate, I mean, at the station at the airport and she tells this story. So the, the, the ticket agent says, oh, by all means, I will, <clears throat> I'll book him a fly. I mean, I'll, I'll reserve him a flight. I just won't do it on, on, you know, paper. And I will give me his name and his credit card number. And I'll have the ticket ready for him and his boarding pass ready for him. And I'll meet him at the door. And the res agent has to say, I don't have his credit card. I didn't ask for it. And I only know his last name. I don't even know his first name. Well, you know, as you know, you've got to have the first name and last name, and it's got to match on your boarding pass. It has to match whatever kind of ID that you're going to show at security checkpoint. Well, the res agent's beside herself. She's hysterical. She doesn't know how to call this guy. She doesn't know anything about him. So <laughs> she says, okay, well, do something. And so the ticket agent says, don't worry. I'll handle it. The ticket agent decides that she's going to buy a ticket herself in her name on her credit card. Now, she doesn't ask anybody if she can do this. She doesn't tell anybody she's doing this. She just decides this is what she's going to do. And she's going to, I just love this, really. 
she's going to put her name on the boarding pass. She's going to have the ticket in her name, and then she's going to work it all out when, she, when they get to the gate, and um, it's just going to be fine. So she happens to tell her supervisor that she's doing that. And the supervisor said, well, I, I mean, that's nice that you're going to do that. She said, but how are you going to get him through security? And so, you know, if you are, if you, like if you're taking a, a severely disabled person through security or, or an unaccompanied minor or something where you can get permission to go through security. So she says, I'm going to get him permission to board me as the, <laughs> as the handicapped person or whatever. And the supervisor said, but, you know, Colleen, that's lying. And she said, well, it's for the better. I mean, it's for the good. She said, no, 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 I don't think you should lie. So she just sort of walks away. I mean, it's her, she's not telling the girl not to do it. And so the girl starts worrying about it. And she decides she's going to go talk to the TSA. Now we have the TSA, and we have the government plus three Southwest employees, right? <laughs> so she goes over to her friend that's a TSA guy, and she says, you know, this is what I'm going to do. You just need to turn your head the other way and let it go. <laughs> and he looks at her and he says, I can't do that. I'll get fired. And so, as I said, life's all about relationships. So she looks at him like this and she says, now, Chris, did I feed you last week when we had a barbecue on the ramp? And he said, yes, ma'am. And she said, well, then you're going to do this for me. And I don't care if you have to go to the bathroom when I'm going through and you leave, but I am going through this security checkpoint and my hair is going to be on fire and you are going to make sure that it happens. Yes, ma'am. Or else I'm never inviting you to a Southwest party again. We, we invite everybody to our party. So, okay. So... Now she's getting nervous because it's 10 minutes to push and the guy's not there. And she, she knows the plane is ready to push. So she calls the gate, fourth employee, Southwest. And she, said, she explains it all. And, and the gate agent says, well, gosh, the plane is boarded. I better go on board and talk to the captain. Now, if you know anything about the airline business, you know that on-time performance is the be-all and the end-all. And if people don't push the plane on time when they're supposed to, they have to justify it to us within hours because that's our business. So she goes on the plane. He's in the cockpit. He's going through the checklist. She tells him the story. And he gets out of the cockpit. She's afraid he's about to hit her, you know. He gets out of the cockpit. He goes to the front of the airplane. He announces the entire story to the cabin of people and says, I'm going to wait for this gentleman. Meanwhile, he has asked her how far the man is from the airport. And this was her second little white lie. She said, oh, just 10 minutes. She didn't have a clue where he was, right? <laughs> just 10 minutes. He said, okay. So he tells the passengers, and he says, we're going to wait for him. Is that okay with you? He gets a round of applause from the passengers. They were fine with it. They had got it. They understood it. He goes out. He doesn't want, he knows the guy is going to be a mess, so he, he doesn't want to embarrass him. So he goes out to the end of the jetway and to wait for him so he can walk him down the jetway just so he won't. Well, the guy gets there, he runs his shoes and hands, he runs through with the ticket agent, he gets on the plane, he's huffing and puffing, he's really pretty emotional, and so he says to the captain, I can't believe you held this plane for me. It is now 18 minutes late, departure. And the, the captain says to him, the plane wasn't going any place without me and I wasn't going any place without you. So he takes him on the plane. People are wonderful to him on the plane. People are really wonderful when they know they can help. I mean, when they know the situation, they write him prayers, they said prayers with him, they wrote him poems. I mean, it was just an incredible story, really. 
Okay, he gets on the ground wherever he was going. I think it was Nashville. And um, one of our employees meets him in a car and takes him to the hospital. And the young man did um, pass in, within 10 or 12 hours of his arrival. Now, here's why I tell you this story. It isn't, well, I'll put it this way. How did we, how did Southwest Airlines, the leaders of Southwest Airlines, hear this story? It wasn't from any one of the employees that were involved. It wasn't because any customer on that flight contacted us and said, I can't believe that you held this plane for 18 minutes and, you know, inconvenienced me. It wasn't any of those things. It wasn't any of those ways. It, it wasn't because anybody asked for money back. It wasn't because the captain thought he had to justify why he was 18 minutes late. Because they all knew that it was the right thing to do. We heard this two weeks after the grandson's funeral when the grandfather blogged about it and talked about how the entire Southwest family just adopted him and held him in their arms for this entire thing. They followed him through the funeral. They followed him to get him back to where he lived. Mm -hmm. They made arrangements to get his luggage to him. I mean, that's just the kind of people that we have. It's, you know, and like I said, you don't do any of those things for the accolades. But when it, you know how social media, and you were talking about that earlier, I mean, you know how things spread like that. Well, when he put it on the blog, it went everywhere. And we got 1,017 positive emails or letters or notes on that one story that the leaders of Southwest Airlines had nothing whatsoever to do with except that they empower their people and their people feel comfortable and trust that they really can make the right decisions. And to me, that is really what servant leadership is all about. That was a long story. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> now, shall I tell you the bad ones where they backfire? Can, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do yeah. it really quick. The backfire ones are we tell our people... Uh, you know, you got to know your audience. You got to, uh, you know, use a sense of humor if you, if that's your thing. You know, we, if it's not, then don't try. If you can't remember the punchline, don't be telling jokes on the PA, you know. If you can sing and you have a good voice, then by all means sing. You're, but if you can't sing or can't carry a note, then do not sing. You know, so we basically tell them, use your strengths and... Um, know what your strengths are, know what your weaknesses are, and go forth. <laughs> well, we, we have many that kind of don't know their audience as well. You know, it takes a little experience. I mean, like, for example, men that are, uh, I say men, men and women that are flying at 6.30 in the morning reading their Wall Street journals or whatever, they don't want to be playing games with the flight attendants and, you know, having a rowdy time. Now, on a Friday night when they're on their way back, you know, maybe then it's a beer and a joke and whatever. And so you kind of learn that through experience. Well, this one young flight attendant, just adorable girl, actually, just delightful. There was, I'm not much into sports, but there was, um, basketball is the only thing I really understand. But there was some big football game. I don't know if it was the... NFL playoffs or what. But anyway, there's some big game, and it was clear that the losing party, um, that their fans were going back home. And she obviously didn't know very much about the teams either. <laughs> and she made some kind of statement up front on the front PA about, you know, well, everybody's got to lose and blah, blah, blah. And I guess the, and the coach had apparently done something that was pretty verbalized socially and me, on the media that wasn't too kind or it was kind of embarrassing, I guess. So she made a reference to that. And most of the plane laughed. 
But when she was going back to get coffee to serve, she noticed a young lady in the back of the plane crying. So she didn't think it had anything to do with what she said. She, you know, leaned down to see if she could help. Well, it was the daughter of the coach. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Well, of course, she was just beside herself. So, you know, and when you do, I mean, I make many mistakes every day of my life. And when you do, you just got to own them, right? You got to not be defensive about it, but you just got to pray that the Lord will help you get out of them and, and, and be as honest and forthright as you can be. And you go from there. <laughs> mm. One of the things I've been so impressed with is your commitment to serving people and the golden rule that yes. you want to others. How do you get fired at Southwest? How do you fire? How do you get fired? What oh, does it take you get, get fired? fired for not following the golden rule. You get fired for attitude much more than you will for uh, uh, poor performance in whatever your skill is supposed to be. We actually hire for attitude and train for skills. Now, don't get nervous. We won't put a plane in the cockpit that can't fly. <laughs> we won't put a you know, mechanic out there to fix an airplane that doesn't know how. But we do turn down and terminate people who are highly skilled in whatever discipline it is that they've been hired to fill if there is anything about their demeanor, attitude, or behavior that tells us, number one, that they don't practice the golden rule, Number two, that they are disrespectful of others. And number three, that they think they're at a little bit higher level than anyone else. Because honestly, we recognize that every member of the team's contribution is truly equally important. Because if everybody doesn't do what he or she has committed to do, then the entire package doesn't get delivered. Mm. And um, you have to support. And you, I think this is the hardest thing because we have such a loving culture. I mean, we're one of the few companies in the world really that does use the word love a lot. And it's not just because we serve Love Field, but it's because we really do love. I mean, we, you know, LUV is our stock, New York Stock Exchange symbol. And um, so we've really capitalized on that word, but we, we really do treat each other like family. And we embrace anyone who is willing to embrace us in return. Um, so you can't just say, well, you know, that's just Chris. Chris has all these great strengths, but he's not warm or he's not uh, caring and he doesn't. He's not respectful of others, but we'll put that over here. You've got to walk your talk. You cannot hold people accountable if you don't hold yourself accountable first. Um, you, you know, you just can't, I mean, you can try, <laughs> my, but it doesn't work. You know, I, I don't want to get into all this. I, we've got three minutes left, but I can tell you, you can learn just as much from a bad leader as you can from a good one. And as a girl growing up, I learned wonderful things from my mom. And I learned a lot of the ways I didn't want to act and be from my dad. So it's, you know, I mean, you can, if you study and observe like I do, you can sort of pick out, you know, what you see works for other people and try just, it has to be real for you. So we are not, we are very um, forgiving when it comes to someone who makes a human mistake, we are very forgiving. If somebody has to, takes a little while longer to pick on something, uh, to pick up something that not necessarily safety related, safety has to be number one for our business. But anything other than that, we're very forgiving. But we are not forgiving when it comes to human behavior because we are very clear what the expectation is. We set it out in stone almost, in blood almost. And when you sign on to be a Southwest employee, you know what you're committing to. And we remind you of it quite often. And um, it, we're not mean-spirited about it. But we, um, I have had to fire some very good friends that are still friends today. Mm. 
that's tough. But I also, as a single mother, um, when my son was um, a t teenager going through some bratty teenage years, which you two sweet boys don't seem to have done at all. I don't understand it. <laughs> so I wasn't as good a mom as, um, <clears throat> as your mom was, I guess. But I had to practice some really tough love. And I've had to do that at, um, you know, at Southwest as well. One last question for you. How did you spend the majority of your time as president? You know what? Being president was my least favorite job, <laughs> mm. honestly, because I had to, um, I love people. Um, and I have a, I'm very, the people at Southwest call me the mom of Southwest and they call me the mom of our culture. I like to get right in the heart of it. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't think that I'm at any different level than anybody else. I don't, I'm not a social gadfly. I mean, I love to sit down at round tables and talk to people, but I, I don't do the, you know, I don't know, the heels and the, it's just not who I am. I'm just very down to earth, very, what you see is what you get. I don't like pretenses. And um, it, I didn't mind talking to the media, but it wasn't my favorite thing to do. And I hated the Wall Street part of it. It just, it just wasn't who I am. I mean, it's not like I didn't get it. It's just that wasn't fun for me. I like to, and one of our core values is to have fun. Can you imagine? I mean, fun loving attitude is one of our core values. I like to enjoy everything I'm doing. So I'm not saying that I didn't like those people, but it just wasn't near as much fun as my favorite job at Southwest really was when I was executive vice president customers because to us customers are employees first passengers second shareholders third much to the distress of wall street but you know what it works is um it, you said it 40 years profitability no other airline can say that now some of those profits have been mighty mighty small but nevertheless i mean wow and so, you know, when I could get my nose all wrapped around employees and passengers and vendors and embrace it, it's all about the relationships. I had a blast when I had to get more stuffy in my mind or stiff or what, not any of those things because I am who I am, but it just wasn't near as much fun. I didn't enjoy it as much. Hmm. Well, so. thank you so much. It's thank been you. Honor to have you. Thank here. you for having me. Mm-hmm.